for time. Uh, my talk title I'm Sri Kumar. I like to be called as Sri. And uh, welcome to this post lunch session. I know this is a very cozy auditorium. <laughs> okay. So how many people are sleepy? <laughs> With show of hands. Okay. How many people don't want to see code? <laughs> and a show of hands. Oh, well, very few. That's good. Uh, so this talk will be about creating services in Android, uh, mostly the bare bones. And since the audience is just speaking, I'm giving you guys some additional background. Yeah, one more minute and we'll be ready to go. Where did you get the theme from? Created by me. The point is Gentium. Plus. <laughs> Free it for cinematic music. I think I spent more time creating the template than I did on the talk. I hope that doesn't show up on the talk. <laughs> but maybe not, because I've been staring over this for a while in office, so hopefully it will all work. I can send you a template later if you wish. So. Yeah. It's, it's not much of a template, you know. So. Gentium, some accents like that line, uh, only they are made by these. So. Of course, I chose the font too, so not that I made it. Okay, time to start. Is this my direction? No. That's all. This is audible, right? In a file. You don't have hand mic kind of thing, do Yeah. So I'm, I guess I'm more comfortable with this because the mic is a little direction. So, without further ado, uh, she and uh, I work as a software architect in Innovine Software. Uh, we actually are currently working uh, a lot on Android. So I'm not an app developer. Uh, I guess a lot of talks here uh, would be mostly, mostly about apps because that's where the majority of the activity is. Uh, I develop systems mostly. Uh, so. It, it, you know, you won't see things like a fancy GUI, you may see some printers here and there. I'm mostly trying to illustrate the concepts that go towards creating services in Android. So what's the motiv motivation behind this talk? Does anybody else hear a feeble echo? Or is it just me? Nobody else. Okay. So, I propose this talk out of sheer frustration actually. Uh, so I, I saw that talks were up for submission and uh, I was struggling to write services on a new platform, Android. I just started off three months back on this. Okay. My background is mostly I'm a C programmer, C, Python, assembly language even. Uh, I'm no Java genie. Okay. That, that doesn't mean that I consider Java as a junk language, in fact no. Uh, I like Java, but hardcore Java people may not like my Java code yet. But, but we we'll keep those offline, right? <laughs> so uh, the motivation behind this talk is that uh, writing services is useful and fun. So first, a service is a background activity which does a lot of work for you. Uh, and it's mostly a complementarization thing in Android. And it's also painful. That's why I'm trying to give this talk here. Uh, this code is filled with a lot of code. Uh, and very less UI, as I said earlier, right? So just bear with me. If you are sleepy, that's okay too. <laughs> I hope I don't break anybody's sleep here. Uh, so what's the deal with writing services in Android, right? So so you have you know good amount of documentation, uh, but it's I, I don't think it's really enough. So so documentation for services, I firmly believe, shouldn't be like documentation for the API, uh, because once that happens, it becomes harder to write a service which actually does something. So most of the documentation that I have found uh, is scattered. Uh, a lot of places you see the Google searches for a lot of things. I have tried to collect all these things in one area. Uh, I am not planning here to, create, to have created something new. In fact, I haven't. Uh, I have brought together diverse pieces of documentation, combined it with my experimentation, and I am going to present that result to you. And documentation deals mostly with uh, the mechanics. 
I don't know how much a uh, 45 minute session can make a difference in this area, uh, but let's see. I'll give it a try. Right? So, what's the objective of this talk? So, first, a clarification of the term patterns that are used. It's not design patterns like the famous Mr. Gadi which uh, he uses. Okay, so don't expect that. Uh, this talk tries to give you a quick overview of AIDL, which is Android Interface Definition Language. So, we are, we'll mostly be creating services based on AIDL because they are the most hardest. Right? In my humble opinion, having worked with them for a while now. So, I'll try to say what the features and the pains of working with these interfaces are. And I'll try to show you how you can write useful services as patterns. So, when you're trying to create a service, a background activity with which you want to interact in an application, uh, you are mostly not too much concerned. So, as an application developer, you may be concerned with the exact thing the service does. But as a generic service writer, there are certain patterns that you can find useful, that you will find useful. And if you actually probe into the Android open source, you will find a lot of this there. So, uh, that's my attempt. I will try to define services as some kind of patterns. I, I will only cover one or maybe maximum of two uh, here because that's all the time we have. So, an introduction to Android services. So, the service concept, if you uh, okay, quick poll. So, uh, how many people have written services here? Android services. Oh, good number of people. I am going to be in trouble. Okay. Uh, AIDL services, anybody? One, two, three. Uh, okay, a few. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, part of this talk is to show you that it's maybe not that painful, you know? So, maybe not that painful. Um, so, for those who are not aware, a service is an application component. I'm sure pretty, pretty much everybody is aware of that. It's typically used for long running operations which are running in the background, but not necessarily. Uh, like, I think everything else in Android, uh, the Android documentation is pretty clear about this. Unless the documentation says that they are creating a thread, they are not creating any. So, the same applies for concepts, the service concept. So typically we associate service with threads, right? But if you create an Android service, and of course I'll show you some code later on, so just bear with me for a minute. If you create an Android service, it will not automatically create either new processes or threads for you. And uh, there's some classifications for Android services, uh, broadly I classify them as either interaction based uh, and based on application boundaries. So, this talk is about demystifying the in inter process communication based, AIDL based services. Because I think that's that's the hardest part. It's also the one that we are least likely to use, but well, that's that's what this talk is all about. So AIDL based IP services. So what's AIDL? Android interface definition language. It looks an interface definition looks similar to an interface definition from Java, and uh, there are tools in the Android toolkit which actually compile this into a separate code and create a service and create stubs for you for marshalling and unmarshalling. So, so when you are typically talking about a service, uh, in the generic sense, you have a client interacting with the server someday, not necessarily the socket way, right? And uh, typically the two major concepts there are marshalling and unmarshalling. So you marshal something on the client side, you unmarshal it on the server side, then the server does something for you, it returns a result to you. Right? So ADL is the way to easily do this on Android. Uh, and this is all about inter-process communication. I'm not going to deal with uh, the simpler cases of uh, the communication inside the process. But the samples that I will show you will all be inside a single process. So that's a kind of a dichotomy that uh, I'll, I'll say later why I did it. Um, so if you read through the Android documentation, you'll see that uh, there's something else with which you can create uh, inter-process uh, service, uh, inter services. So that mechanism is called messenger. So messenger base is based on uh, manual manipulation of packets so, so you basically send a message from a process to another process where 
you have to manually take care of encoding and decoding the packet. So I'll stay away from it uh, because I don't find it that rich. And uh, I have mostly uh, done ideal because of its richness and its appropriateness to my work. So why why are we going to take all the pain? So if you read a little bit of it, the idea, you will see that it's not really recommended. There's this documentation around it. Uh, people say don't try the idea unless it's really necessary. Okay, so I, I choose the idea because it gives you natural inter interaction to the services. So you basically connect to the service and you write code which looks very much like code you would use inside your program. And then you can interact with the service in a very natural programmer-like manner uh, across processes uh, where you can call the service and the service can call you back and you can pass complex objects as parameters. Uh, so that's the reason to take all this pain. So if, if you really don't have a need to take all this pain, maybe you shouldn't. Okay. Uh, so first we look at uh, a hello service which I think is mandatory given that more than half, an, half of the audience has in different services. Right? So we'll jump deep directly into the AIDL service. Uh, so for those who actually already developed services, you probably are already aware of on bind and uh, on service, intent service and uh, so on and so forth. So, oh, okay, my, my image got chewed. Right, no problem. Uh, so what? So what does a hello service look like? Right? So a service typically, uh, when you have a service implementation in Android, you need to implement a, a class which extends service, and then you need to implement certain methods inside it. So if you want a real service, you typically implement on uh, and we'll of course come to the details of all this very quickly. Um, and you expose a programmatic interface for your clients or for, for your consumers by implementing methods, by implementing method stuff, stubs. So, so you basically define an interface, you define a stub for the interface. So the interface itself is processed by a tool and it generates additional code around it. And uh, inter-process communication happens using the binder driver, uh, or more specifically the iBinder interface in Android. Of course, I will not go deeper into the iBinder I interface because that's more complication. So, services are exposed via Android Manifest.xml. So, I, I hope everybody here has programmed with Android. Anybody who has not? Anybody who has not programmed in Android? Okay, so, so mostly you have to export services via the manifest as uh, with special nodes and all that. So the client apps, so once you write a service which exposes on bind and exports its services via the manifest, client apps can bind by intents and they can use the services provided. And uh, client apps can actually provide callbacks which the service can directly call you back. So if anybody here has done RPC, they're perhaps familiar with all these things. So you call a service using a programmatic interface, the service calls you back with a programmatic interface. So if the, if the application wants to request uh, to be called back by the service, it has to implement stops itself. So typically the service implements stops. If you have client programmers are doing the same, then the client also has to implement the stops. Okay. So we'll quickly have a look at a service in a talk. Right. So this is a simple uh, server which I have defined. It's called binding IPC server. So if you go through the documentation, uh, you'll find that Service, services can be binding or not binding. Services can be binding or started. So I implement the binding IPC server, which extends the service. Okay, and uh, there's implementation of on bind here, uh, which you see. Okay, and it's basically returning an I binder. So, 
So what, what's the I binder I'm returning an API here? So it's interesting to see what the API here is. Oh, I'm very sorry for having examined. I'll just show you the I idea first. So we are going to implement a very simple service here. Uh, and it exposes only one method, which is start operation. Okay. And it can take a callback, uh, which, so basically we have a client which will start a service and call something which will call you back. So that's all, because that mostly shows most of the things that we need for a hello service. Okay. So it's very, very easy to see here. So you just have an interface, it's a server API with a very simple uh, definition. So this will be processed by the AIDL tool to generate more complicated code, which I won't show you, but I'll show you how to use it. Okay, so we come back here. So we take the server API, which is here, and we implement a stub for it. So what, why is the stub? Because the AIDL code, code generator generated code from it. Now that, that code itself will expect you to implement a stub so that you control the interface. You control what, what you do with your interface. Right? So our stub implements start operation, which takes the call back, okay, and uh, it does something inside it. Okay? The most important thing it does is it, it calls the, the, the client side itself. So it takes the call, uh, call back. Uh, takes the call back, okay, and uh, in a thread it actually calls the callback a few times. So, what's the callback definition looking like? So, I showed you the server side interface. So, the callback definition is also pretty simple. It's op result, just a single function which has a code. Okay. So, so all byte returns. The interface which the server exposes. Now, how does the client actually access all this interface? All right, so in comes the Android manifest.xml. Which actually exposes the service using the service tag. Okay. And uh, it actually defines an intent filter where it allows access to that to the service. And the other thing is, the most important one, is that we export the service. So Android exported equal to true is what ensures that your, man that your manifest exports your service. Okay, so that's mostly all to it. So, uh, and on the client side, right, so we have a service caller, uh, which is an application, it's an activity. So what it does is, uh, I didn't the ah, okay. So here's its on create of that activity. Uh, so basically, the starting of the activity, you, you use an intent. So I give the full name for the intent here, uh, so that it doesn't clash with anything else. So the whole name of the intent is here, and uh, later on you bind to a service using bind service. And the interesting thing here, here is that there's service connection. So what's the service connection all about? Right. So when, when you connect to a service, it's associated with a connection with which you can monitor the connectivity to the service. So Android can kill, kill processes when, when there is this memory and all that. So, so you need to keep track of the connection to the service. Okay. So uh, what's inside the service connection? So service connection itself has only two things inside it. One is on service connected which is here. And the other one is on-service disconnected, which you see on the uh, next thing. So the on-service connected uh, is called when your service is ready to service your request. And there, again, you have an iBinder, like earlier. And uh, that's casted to a server API. So it's type cast to a server API, like here. Uh, once you have that API, you have control over the or the service from the client end. And one thing about IPC services is that there is no way to predict which thread they will run on when you are running across cross boundaries. Uh, for Android AIDL services, there is always a thread pool. So unlike 
other forms of Android development, uh, where unless you create a thread explicitly, there is no thread which is started. Uh, here there is a pool of threads out of which one will be located to your, something will come to your device randomly. So you cannot, when you are interacting with a service, you cannot expect to be on the same thread as the UI. So you have to typically use something like run on UI thread. Uh, if you have to update your UI as a result of interaction with the service. Okay, so what we do is, uh, on the UI thread we call it start operation. Actually there is no great need for that, uh, except that I wanted to update the UI. Uh, so, from here on, your interaction with the uh, service will look like mainstream programming. So, you can see API dot start operation. So, looking at that, you cannot say whether it is, uh, what do you say? Uh, local or remote, except that you have to catch remote exceptions. Okay. So, this is kind of the brain of uh, service programming. So, you are allowed to catch the remote exceptions because the service can go away in time. Okay. Uh, and, well, that's about all there is to a simple service. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes when I work with the service, I do directly inside the computer there. Uh. Uh, remote exception not caught. So for that you have to use the... You have to, yeah, you have to catch remote exceptions. Remote exception is that kind of thing. Server, service dies on the other end. You have to catch it. If you don't actually catch it, of course, you can't... Code will come back. So that is how it is. Okay, so coming back to the slides. After we talk, oh, no. I'll show you guys this in action. Actually, there's not much to it. I'm running the emulator on my network, which is even slower. Okay, so, so we have a client app which is running here, and it starts the remote operation, and the remote operation exits immediately. Uh, but the server keeps calling you back. On this way. Okay, it calls it about 10 times here. The UI is responsible because the callback happens on different thread than the UI thread. Right? So typically, if your application does not respond for 5 seconds or something, you get an EMR. Is that correct? I have not developed much of the applications myself. Uh, so well, that, that's all a simple demo was. Right? So let's go back to a little more about. Uh, Excuse me? Yeah? Uh, can you go back to the server code? Where you have, where you are calling the callback, which is possible. Can I go back to the server code where I am calling the callback? Yeah. So, yes. can you tell me why you, why you are creating another instance of the callback, there, the server callback? Which one? This, the exact. This final server callback. Yeah. Can't access oh, that's just so that I can access it from the inner uh, class. You know, my Java is weak, so my college intern tells me that's the way to do it. So that's why, that's what I do. It, so. <laughs> Anyway, you're, you're getting it from the parameter, right? Yeah, yeah but you, I can call it directly inside. I'll have to keep another method and just, I think, some Java thing. So. And I may read in Java, I told you that. In the beginning, it's a primary disclaimer. Yeah. What is the use of that thing inside the parameter? Which one? Where you will find, there is a union and uh, parameter which is the parameter. Right, so that's getting passed back to the callback here. So, no, there is a email, so is there a... Yeah, oh, okay, okay, I didn't explain that, yeah. So, uh, parameters can be in, or in, out, or out, I think. So, most elementary parameters will be in by default, like right? Simple integers and all that. But you can have complex types which can be in and out and in out. So, if you have complex types, you have to define them. Those types have to implement parser level. So, well, I guess, that's how I can tell you now, so. If you have other stuff to cover. But does that answer the question? It's just, you can have in, out, or in, out. So they can also be returned. Yeah? You said that there's a thread pool. Yeah. You, you talked about a thread pool. So when the client made that call, API dot something, yeah. does it return immediately or? The client returns immediately, yeah. Okay. That's because why you said the UI is responsible. Yeah, that's why the response. UI is responsible. And if I call back the client in the same thread, without having the thread, the callback will get invoked in the same context, which will be a UI thread context. Okay, so 
So it doesn't matter what, so when you do API dot uh, start operation, mm. what if the actual method was a very long, let's say it was a sleep, a five second sleep, yeah. the client would still not, I mean it's, it's not actually sleeping, it's the, the client, um, I mean, I'm a little confused about the, the interaction over there, because mm. if it's a synchronous call, yeah. Is control coming back to the client or? Control is coming back to the client, yes. So that's why a thread is doing the work, right? If I had done the work in the same place, then the client would be waiting for the return result. And there is a way, so there is something called one way. So if you add a one way parameter to the ID file for interface, that won't happen. So it will get called and you will return immediately. So, so that's a slightly deeper topic, which, uh, okay, so. I'll quickly go here because. Right? So, what's so nice there? Right, so we saw some nice things you can call an application very easily. It looks like a programmer's interface, except that you have to catch a dead exception. So, you don't have control over binding. So, I didn't talk about it, and the documentation doesn't talk about it. But on bind, uh, the return value is cached. So, if once the service is running, on bind typically gets called only once. Okay, that came as a shock to me. I Still haven't figured out why that is, but that's the way it is. So that means you cannot change the interface. You have one interface which you expose for the lifetime of the service. So that, in my opinion, is not so nice. No control over that. So you you don't have any control over threading. So there's another thread pool that I was talking about. Okay, the code is messier than in in process interface. Right? So you typically if you call a function or a method, you don't really say catch remote exception. Uh, I didn't talk about this here, but uh, there is no support for exceptions across processes. So you call a server uh, method which call, raises an exception, then the service will die. And if the server calls a callback which raises an exception, the client will die. Is that true? Yeah, it's neither that. I, I guess I made a mistake there, but that's fine. But uh, the summary is that exceptions are not passed back and forth across processes. And catching dead remote object exceptions is so there's a lot of messy code. And of course, callbacks are invoked in some thread pool, so that complicates programming, which is already, I think, two questions around that area. So you can already see it's very complicated. And the last thing is there's no concept of versioning. So once you expose a service and that is used by multiple people outside your app, that's it, you're dead. You have to keep track of that same function signatures forever, unless you want to decide to break the compatibility. Okay, so what are the common service patterns? Uh, now we'll come to, you know, typically you have only so many things that a service does. The, the internals, the mechanics of what the service does. For example, you have a camera service. The camera service has a lot of work to do. But from an application interface point of view, it's calling you, there's some initialization, it keeps calling you back once every so many while the, when it has a frame, right? So, this kind of a pattern is what I call a lock pattern. Okay. Uh, there are services where simultaneous people would want access to shared resources. Uh, so if you look up these kind of services, uh, you will find that they fall, fail, they fall under either a serialized or a broadcast pattern. So there will be some kind of serial access to, the, uh, to some object on the line. And there will be some broadcast. So, for example, you have sensors, right? So, you say, uh, register me as a listener. So, there might be multiple listeners to the sensor. Uh, in which case, this becomes a broadcast pattern. Okay. There's the less common thing, at least in the Android world, because of the limited footprint, uh, is service versioning. So, as I say, right, you always have to maintain backward compatibility. Uh, that's also possible to provide. Uh, so, on by returns an interface. Now, from that interface, you can control, you can provide control as another query interface. So, somebody who is familiar with Quagba or Palm would perhaps identify with this. So, you provide a query interface function, uh, which itself provides you another interface. That will provide you some kind of service versioning. Of course, you could argue why such kind of things are required on a uh, mobile handheld device. And you know, if there's a need, it's possible to implement it. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, so we'll look at the log pattern uh, for want of time <laughs> only, I guess. So, a, a, a bigger look at the log pattern. So, log, so you have a lot of services where you, you typically can enter a single object and one process which needs 
to access the object. And that can be easily done by enforcing locking and unlocking behavior. So uh, a lot of people who have done multi-thread programming are well aware of this. So you lock the object, you use the object in some way, then you unlock it. Right? And that looks very, very simple. Except that uh, you have other questions like how do you handle multiple application access? What is the appropriate threading model for this kind of access? Uh, if so, in Android, if, if an application locks something and doesn't go away, uh, doesn't unlock the resource, then it will be, be very hard for to make it to make the same resource accessible by others unless the service implements a policy, okay, leading to starvation. So, what we'll do is we'll look at a lock service implementation, which is again some more simple code. Nothing more complicated here. Uh, actually, when I just to step back a little, when I start, when I gave the talk proposal, I had something very big in mind. Then I gave a similar talk to my colleagues in office, and then I realized it was not possible to give a talk like this in 45 minutes or half an hour. So I had to scale this down drastically. So, so all the details that I not I will not cover here. Perhaps after my talk is over, for interested people, I can cover outside. So. So I understand this is a hard topic to cover. I can see a few sleepy faces. I'm happy with it. <laughs> Not too many. <laughs> okay. So coming back. So how, how does one implement a log service? So typically, what I do, right? I'm a systems guy. So my idea of logs are somebody, let's say a camera. Right? So client program wants to access the camera. So the whole client process has access to the camera. So that means I associate the locks with the calling process. Because there could be multiple threads there. Remember, this is a simple programming, this is a regular programming paradigm. If I gave you an object on which you can make calls, at the same time, I don't say that you cannot call it from different threads. So I'm making ownership applicable to the process. That's what I typically do. There are reasons why you wouldn't want to do that. If you have uh, a GUI, let's say, which is which is interacting with the same sensor in multiple uh, uh, viewports, for example, then there is no sense of uh, ownership per app, right? It's more like ownership per thread. Uh, but this is a pattern that I mostly developed here, uh, and I use a worker thread for serialization. So what do I mean by that? Right? I was talking about a thread pool. So now remember, uh, this Android, and uh, nobody says. What is the size of the thread pool? Yeah. So nobody tells you what the size of the thread pool. So in the emulator that I run, it's like three threads. Okay. And I haven't really checked in my real devices. So ideally, what you want to do is handle the threading yourself uh, and create any number of threads that you really want. So typically, I find it very convenient to, to start threads on service creation. And uh, I find that, that modeling. Uh, IPC calls as producer consumer uh, problem. So, uh, so Java provides java.util.concurrent, right? Which, which provides easy ways to pass around data in a thread safe manner and with so many other patterns. So, I use that, and uh, in the service implementation, I would typically pass in the service implementation, I typically do minimal work inside the function itself and pass around that data to the worker thread. So that's something that you would typically do in other kinds of services, but it's equally applicable here too. Because you do not know what is the size of the thread pool. So unless you want to take a chance, do more profiling of it and so on, uh, I wouldn't advise that. Okay. Uh, do I have a solution for starvation, which is uh, applications calling the lock and not unlocking it? Uh, actually, no. So, so there's a way to so if, if an application dies without calling unlock, there's a way to evict those clients because you get dead object exceptions. Uh, but, but that's an implementation detail. So it's hard to automate it. It has to be uh, application service specific policies. OK, so with that, let's have a look at, quickly have a look at some code. Uh, 
that Avalanche Service here called Exclusive Server, uh, which again has the same, a little different API. It has a lock where you actually display a callback. There's a start operation which will result in calling of the callback and there's an unlock. So it's as simple as this. Okay, and the server callback remains the same like from the previous example. Oh, sorry. I clicked in the wrong place. So you again have an op result, you know, which has an integer, right? as simple as that. So how does our exclusive server change? Right? So let's see. So we have a lock implementation here, which is again a stub implementation. Okay, server API dot stub. Uh, so what does the lock do? So inside these procedures you have you get something called get calling API which will tell you who your caller is. So, as I said before, I associate the PID with the lock. So, uh, so I ensure that if nobody else has logged it, or the owner has, is calling the lock again, then I allow access. Otherwise, I return false. Okay. So, there's the simplest thing that you can do, right? But it's fairly effective for the kind of things that you are doing in Android. I mean, this is not something which, which you are doing for some big, uh, enterprise applications somewhere else. And it's very simplistic, but it's fairly effective for this kind of environment. And unlock is also fairly clear. So if, if the owner is calling unlock, then I clear over, over my the my owner object, which actually holds the lock. Okay. So I have an operation called start operation, which is returning boolean again, true or false depending on whether the call is successful or not. Okay. Uh, here, what I do is I check the uh, ownership with respect to the PID. Okay, if the ownership doesn't work, nothing for the caller, return false. Otherwise, I package everything inside another class, the operation, which is the integer that was sent from the client side, and I put it inside a work queue. So remember, I was talking about uh, uh, Java .util.concurrent. I find it very useful and array blocking queue. In this case, I have an array blocking queue with a with a single element. Uh -oh. So why is it a single element? So this is where you control how many operations are handled by the thread or how many of them can be queued. So that kind of thing. It, it can be anything you want. So you can change the kind of paradigm you want to use here. Uh, so I, I put it into the queue, which is a blocked array queue. And I have a thread, which is a worker thread, uh, which is started on service startup. And so only job is to listen for commands that are coming from the IPC and then executing them. So in this case, it snips one second and calls the callback. So as, as simple as that. It should be the synchronized primitives in just the right place so that, uh, so that takes care of uh, any access issues that, uh, any multi threading issues that may be there. And uh, well, the service caller looks exactly the similar, except the way it calls the API, right? So it calls API.lock, has a callback, which the implementation of which I'll show later. And it starts an operation. And all this is happening in the UI thread, courtesy is run on UI thread. And let's see what the operation really does. Uh, so the server ends up calling off result. And again, on the UI thread, we run, we run something. So, so basically, here we have a service which is implementing a lock, uh, but I don't have multiple clients here, right? Not to show. So that's a mistake I made. Uh, but I'll show you this in action. Again, as I said, there's hardly anything to show here because you just say, you know, got ten or something like that, right? So that's a famous Android emulator. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> I'd say you got called back, uh, and you are the owner. And if you actually test this with multiple clients, you will find that it actually works. Uh, and uh, so I'll share all this code somewhere later. Yeah, I'll share all this code somewhere later. I don't have it here in, in the presentation, so perhaps on my website later on. Uh, the, uh, so that covers the lock 
pattern that I was talking about. I don't think we have time for shared access service. Uh, so I'll just put it up for any questions that you have. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so for example, if we have a talk tomorrow, <laughs> okay, so it's like more self promotion, if I may say so. So we have actually enabled a few devices on Android, right? So if you look at the camera service, this several services, typically you find system services going to such great lengths to do things, uh, doing things like IPC. So that's one place where you definitely deploy it. Uh, because one thing I didn't talk about here, uh, what happens is you expose these callbacks to the service, as uh, the client side, right? The question is, how does the client compile against your service? So he needs to have a jar file somewhere. So these things are messy uh, for a typical application. It can be done, but it's messy. So typically you want to do it for simple applications. If you have some kind of great reviews that you want to do inside the application or if you want to if you want to create a system service you will do that so unless you have very specific needs uh, so this doesn't take care of remote procedure calling this is all inside the uh, the same system one never knows uh, maybe it is 7.0 then you have androids communicating to other androids using ibinder no, not iBinder, yeah, I'm using on, by, on iBinder, so. So it's possible to implement it if you want to, but not, not with the supported tools. I think it's possible to, because once you've serialized it, the world is the end, so. You never know. Yeah, all that is very messy. Right? That's, uh, exceptions are tricky, won't propagate across those boundaries. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, close enough. You can ask it as if it is. You know, the start, system services starts at the bottom. Right? If I want to add a new system service, can I do it as a third party application developer? No. Not, not a system service. Of course, you can implement a broadcast receiver or something like that and start a service. See, you're not really dependent on that part of the infrastructure, right? So if you are a system implementer, you have access to tools like init.rc, right? And you have access to the system server process, which actually starts a lot of processes. So, if I am part of the application, yeah. If it is part of that, then it becomes a candidate for you know uh, Android getting killed when the no memory. If I don't want to have. See, well, if 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 an application is binding to you, you will be considered part of that application. Okay. From a scheduling, I mean, it is not. So you won't be killed. Most of the time. Uh, I haven't seen scenarios where that has happened. You understand, right? If a client is bound to the service, the service is considered part of the application. And it's not typically killed very easily, or at all. One thing, the Android says that when all the applications which are bound to a service, mm -hmm. if they unbind it, can yeah. it. So your service comes down, right? I mean, it will no, no, no. Ask the question again. Okay. This service will end mm -hmm. only till the time the application is involved. Yeah, so that's a matter of implementation. You can make it a started service. Can you override that? Yeah, you can. You can have a, something called a started service where you implement on, on start and there's another way to do it. No, how to, where, where should I mention that? Uh, well, I think we're out of time here. Okay. Right, so, <laughs> unless they can, <laughs> they're dragging out kicking and screaming. <laughs> so, you can make it. Yeah. So that's it. So, so I thank all of you here for your presence. I hope it was useful. Uh, and I actually blog at my website, streakmore.in, so I'll put up the slides and the quote there for those interested. And of course, we can. We are obligated to take it offline. Let's just put it that way. All right. Thank you again very much.